Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Author Showcase. I'm your host, Keith Williams. And we really have been busy these last uh, couple of months. We got guests pouring in from all over the country, from all walks of life, uh, who uh, they written a book and they wanted to showcase it. So that's why we call hmm. it the Author Showcase. And we have a published author here in the midst of us. Holly Howe, welcome to the show. Thank you, happy to be here. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, my name's Holly Howe and um, I've, the book that I ended up publishing is on uh, sauerkraut and it's kind of a culmination of a kind of lifelong quest for healthy eating and healthy living. And just always have enjoyed eating the right foods and taking care of my health. And the uh, sauerkraut came into my life when I uh, learned about what healthy cultures ate to stay vibrant and healthy. And that was just one step after another. It wasn't like I was dealing with some dramatic health claim and ended up starting a business around that, but decided to share with the world how uh, a simple food can transform your life. Um, so you, you have an interesting title for your book. So where did that come from? Um, when I, th the, so the title is mouth watering sauerkraut. And most people, when they think of sauerkraut, they might think of that nasty stuff in a can or what they may, may have had uh, drizzled across their um, hot dog, but have never thought of it as anything more out there. And when I got into making sauerkraut, I realized that cabbage is not the only ingredient in sauerkraut. Traditionally, it was made with caraway seeds and juniper berries. But when I started exploring with it and trying to come up with recipes that a whole wide range of people would like, I realized you could ferment more than just cabbage. So I put together recipes that have carrots in them, pineapple, lemon zest, lime zest, <coughs> grated beets, uh, just about anything you can imagine. And I realized when I ate these foods, <clears throat> it really was a mouth-watering, tingling, wow, this is good taste. And all of a sudden that nasty stuff in a can <clears throat> had, if you make it properly, has a lot of nutritional benefits, but also was very delicious. So that's where that kind of mouth-watering came from, trying to get people to realize that sauerkraut can be delicious and it can be a delicious way that we take care of our health. Yeah, because I, I always, you know, thought about that, you know, too, as well. And, you know, that nasty stuff that you put in the hot dog. And I'm like, no, you know, I, I don't, I, I, you know, I don't deal with that. And I know they sell it in the stores. So you bring on like a new twist to sauerkraut? Well, I guess we have to first um, clarify the difference in between the sauerkraut that I promote and make and versus what you're gonna find in a can down in the aisle in their grocery store. <clears throat> so traditionally, people preserved their cabbage or took it on shipping voyages like Columbus to <clears throat> take care of the sellers and made sure that they didn't get scurvy from the high vitamin C content in the sauerkraut. So traditionally, sauerkraut was made in the large wooden vats mixed with salt. And that's all that was in that sauerkraut that was naturally fermented was made with the bacteria that exists on the cabbages and other vegetables you ferment. And those, those bacteria are wonderful little worker bees. They go to work in that jar, in that crop when things are fermenting and create lactic acid to preserve it and give it this little tang. But they're also do, working magic in there. They're increasing the bioavailability of the vitamin C. So there's a much higher level of vitamin C in naturally fermented sauerkraut than in the cabbage you started with. Most of the sauerkraut people are familiar with is in that can down that aisle. That sauerkraut has been pasteurized at a high heat. And so when you pasteurize it, you kill off all the beneficial bacteria, you kill off all the beneficial enzymes. We need those bacteria, we need those enzymes for good gut health for a variety of reasons. And so you first have to realize there's two different sauerkrauts we're talking about the stuff in a can, and then either what you make yourself or would find in the refrigerated section um, at some of the nicer grocery stores. So you wanna be thinking about the right sauerkraut. 
And then that sauerkraut does have a different flavor and you can mix anything you want in with that cabbage to create that wonderful mouthwatering sauerkraut. Um, I, yeah, I never really, you know, thought about that. You know, they really don't put that out there. You always hear about their, their traditional stuff that, you know, that everybody, you know, puts on their hot dogs. Right. Well, and that's so, the thing that has happened with our whole, the whole food industry and big ag and big pharma and the big corporations out there. Traditional cultures many years ago, our great ancestors were taking care of their health in a huge variety of ways. They were eating foods that weren't pasteurized. They weren't eating white flours and uh, rancid oils and processed salts and things. They were eating them as mother nature intended them to. So they were getting their probiotics from their fermented vegetables and fermented pickles that were not pasteurized. They were getting all sorts of nutrients from the raw milk and the raw cheeses. You know, you could go on and on and on. And nowadays, we have to work very hard to get these foods or make these foods that our great ancestors had just by the nature, that's all that was available and that kept them healthy. So now we have to work extra hard to stay healthy by going back to these foods and learning to make them, learning to source out the foods that are gonna nourish us. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to know as to, in terms of the food industry, why do you believe that uh, the industry is pasteurizing, you know, foods. It, it's, it's, it, they're, they're thinking that it's healthier. There was a time, I don't remember the exact dates where the whole milk industry was not a very sanitary um, industry. And so there was a lot of uh, a, a good reason that they were trying to pasteurize the milks. But when you're done properly in a clean dairy, uh, with the right measures and with the cows out on grass where they're supposed to be eating to get the nutrition, it's a perfectly safe process. But when we want to um, be able to ship these products across the country, we want a stable product that's you know a consistent product from batch to batch, then we have to kind of start with a blank slate and kill off everything in there and then add back in the cultures we want. And all of a sudden it takes, it takes the nutrition out of there, but you know, profits, all of that play into it. I like to always um, give the story of Sister Noella. It was talked about in, um, oh, uh, I can't think of the author right now, but um, Sister Noella was making this cheese in the wooden vats. She's a microbiologist by trade and using the wooden uh, paddle to stir the milk and break it into curds, et cetera. And the food police came in and wanted her to start making her cheese and the stainless steel tanks, feeling they were much more sanitary and they would be able to control any E. coli or listeria or whatever might grow in the milk. And so she asked to do an experiment and she, um, oh, it's Michael Pollan's book, Cooked. He talks about this. So she did an experiment where she made a batch of cheese in her wooden vat that's been used for, you know, who knows how long with that wooden paddle that's never been washed. And then she made a bat batch of cheese in the stainless steel tank that had been sterilized and inoculated each batch with E. coli and then made the cheese and then tested the E. coli levels in the end. So as you can probably guess, or if you understand what direction I'm coming from, the stainless steel vat was actually, the E. coli continued to grow. There was huge numbers of E. coli in that batch of cheese, whereas the cheese that was made in the wooden vat without um, sterilizing everything, there was no E. coli in that batch of cheese. And so it's like working with nature, working with the bacteria, and we kill them all off. We don't have the beneficial bacteria that work with that product to kill off the pathogenic bacteria. That's a very interesting uh, story. And all of the, and all the ingredients that you use to make the sauerkraut, is it all natural? Well, actually, the only thing we use to make sauerkraut is cabbage and salt. We don't cabbage? add anything. Yeah, cabbage and salt. There's oh, no vinegar. Man. There's nothing. At, oh, and then the bacteria, which come with the ingredients that come with the cabbage that grows in the ground. And so it is just cabbage and salt. There's no vinegar. Um, some people might want to add starters, but you don't need it because there is 
starters being bacteria that they freeze dried and put in a little pouch that you can add to inoculate it, but that's not necessary. There's plenty of bacteria in the, on the vegetables that you pick and use. And so really it's just cabbage and salt. And then my kind of signature recipes have all the fun things in them with the grated um, carrots and beets and leeks, et cetera. Wow, and you, and you make this yourself and it's all natural. Yes. <laughs> you want me to go over kind of the basic process to make sauerkraut? Uh, yes, please. I mean, I, mean, okay. yes, please. I mean, you may have some people out there that, you know, you know they, they want, want to try, but before you do that, uh, before you do that, uh, so uh, the, the version of sauerkraut that you make, if I call it a version of it, uh, do you sell it or you, do you give it away? Or are you um, planning on marketing it to the stores or? No, no. My um, mission in life really is to get people empowered and to take care of their own health and to do it one bite at a time, one jar at a time. So I don't want to hassle with the uh, health department on you know putting together sauerkraut to sell. It is such an inexpensive product to make yourself that once you learn this skill, it can open up so many doors and it's a very simple process and you make it and you become so excited that you were able to harness these bacteria in this jar and have them produce this wonderful tangy sauerkraut that started off as sweet cabbage and such a neat skill to have. And then you realize that, oh, I'm in charge of my health. This one little food can transform my health and transform what foods I make and who I share them with. And then all of a sudden you want to get the best cabbage. So you start either growing your own or, or you go, well, the best cabbage is gonna probably be grown in my community somewhere. So I need to go find a farmer's market and connect with the farmers that grow it. So all of a sudden we're back to our local food system. We're working with our local farmers. We're keeping our money in the community. And then we're insulated against the whole food production and the transportation of foods, et cetera. And you build your own community, not only with the bacteria that are making these foods for you, but with the people in your community. So I, I don't sell it and people find very quickly if they like this uh, lacto fermented, naturally fermented sauerkraut that it can get very expensive buying a jar of that each week for your family. Mm -hmm. And so by investing in a few supplies to get started, you can make it for, your, for yourself and for your own family and develop this whole broad range of skills and connections with your community. Um, that's, uh, I'm, uh, that's a very admirable thing, you know, <laughs> you know to do, because I know some people, you know, make a unique product like that. The first thing that come out of them, I got to, I got to put this, I got to jar it and, you know, I want to sell it, but it's very rare that I hear something you know, like that. I know a lot of times that we talk about food insecurity and how people really don't have access to healthy fruits and vegetables. And you mentioned something about, uh, you know, putting the money back in communities. And well, where, where I live, of course, you know, we do we do have community gardens, you know, and more are coming up. And I think that would be something that, you know, because right now we don't have any cabbage. You know, right. Um, garden. But I think, you know, like for next spring, that will probably, you know, be a good idea. Then we can like introduce people in the community, you know, how to make right. a, you know, natural, uh, you know, sauerkraut. Now, do I have to buy the book? Oh, no, my website has plenty of information on it. But okay. one thing that before we get sidetracked, you were talking about growing our own cabbage and there's none available right now. Mm -hmm. Fermentation was a way to put up food, to preserve food, to get you through the winter with freshly harvested vegetables and cabbage, et cetera. It wasn't something that we decided to make any time of year. Nowadays we're doing that because we're learning these new skills and all of a sudden, like today, someone hears about um, sauerkraut, they wanna go learn to make it. But ideally you're making in, in the fall, like Korea has what they call Kim Jong Day. And it's in November when all their um, cabbages are harvested and they get it going on the plaza there in Seoul and make huge batches of kimchi. That's only one time a year. That's through their early winter. 
when they're going to make this kimchi and bury it in these beautiful uh, ceramic vessels in the earth to keep it cool. And then they eat off of that throughout the year and finish it up about the same time that the Napa cabbage comes back into you know, season and they're picking the fresh cabbage. So it was a way to preserve foods, not a recipe we make any time of year. It's not like, oh, I want to make chocolate chip cookies. I'm going to run to the store and get everything for chocolate chip cookies. It's more of what's growing right now in my region and what can I make with that? So typically you would be making sauerkraut in the early to late fall or early winter because the cabbage, the, what they call winter cabbage, is grown and picked in the late fall after a few frosty nights that help sweeten up the cabbage. And that's the right cabbage that's perfect for making sauerkraut. And if you make it at that time of the year, it's almost effortless because you have this nice fresh cabbage. It's, there's plentiful bacteria on it. It's the right time of year to, to make it. Your house is not too hot, et cetera. So um, just as you talk about working with these community gardens, it's working, with those gardens to preserve those foods at the time you're harvesting them versus trying to uh, make sauerkraut in the heat of the summer in June with a uh, cabbage that's been stored for six months. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I, I probably think I have to go through this broadcast about several times before <laughs> I, you know, I get it, but I can grow cabbage in the fall. Well, it depends where you're living. And you know, a lot of these fermented foods are different around the world because we did not ship these foods historically wherever we, we weren't getting uh, avocados 365 days a year. There was an avocado season in part, you know, a section of the region of the country where they grew well. But um, it's, I forget where we're going with this, but um, cabbages is generally a fall crop. It's, it's generally in a cooler season crop. And so depending on your, where you're living, that's gonna dictate what you'd be fermenting. But where I we're with cabbage, it does store well and people are wanting to learn a skill. So whatever time of year they want to learn it, it's great, learn that skill. And then you slowly fine tune it to get to the point where you then might be starting to ferment it seasonally. But I have people start where they're at and not try to get too overwhelmed with all the particulars of it. You know, so all, all this can be found on your website? Yes, my website, uh, makesauerkraut.com. <laughs> I start, I ferment a lot of other foods, but I started with sauerkraut because sauerkraut is so easy to ferment and it can be made in a lot of different flavors to appeal to all different members of the family. And it goes well with just about any food and adds a lot of flavor to any meal. And so that's kind of where the website name came from because I started off with the sauerkraut but I have what I call my teaching recipe that takes you through step-by-step step how to make sauerkraut, all the little tips. Uh, I teach it using a, a mason jar, a one quart, one liter mason jar. And that's a nice doable size for people to learn the process. Um, did, did we go into talking a little bit about your book? Um, yeah, the, the book here is, um, uh, Mouth-watering sauerkraut, fermentation made easy. Um, master an ancient art of preservation, grow your own probiotics and supercharge your gut health. There's a lot of research out there on how important our gut health is. And so that's why people are finding out about fermented foods and pickles and sauerkraut is there's a lot of research saying how important it is to take care of your gut health. And the sauerkraut contains all sorts of probiotics that help take care of your gut. So that's where the, mod, the current interest is in these fermented foods. But in this, it's just on sauerkraut and it teaches you what um, supplies you need, ones you can either buy or find around the house. I like people to start simple and start with what they can find around the home and then has, I think 18 or 20 recipes in there, all different flavors you can dream of and then uh, ways to eat it and uh, just how to, how to make your first batch of sauerkraut. Uh, so uh, it's a cookbook. Um, it's a cookbook, but you're cooking with microbes. You're cooking with uh, bacteria. You don't need a stove. You won't even touch a stove at all. You just need your refrigerator to store your sauerkraut in when you're done. Okay, I, I think that I think before we got si sidetracked, you was going to mention uh, the process. Yeah, I and mean, it's a very high level process. It's not for you to 
necessarily just use what I have to say to go make it back, but at least you can understand <clears throat> the, the process behind it. So I, I tell people <clears throat> to think of making a batch of coleslaw. Most people are familiar with coleslaw with the sliced cabbage. And usually there's some onion or other seasonings in there or some grated carrots, whatever. <clears throat> you can personally style your batch of coleslaw how you like it. But what we're doing is taking a big bowl, we're slicing some, uh, preparing some flavoring ingredients, putting those into the bowl. Uh, shredded carrots, chopped garlic, sliced onions, whatever pleases you. Those are the recipes I've put together. Those go into the bowl first, and then we add sliced cabbage. And since I'm talking about fermenting in a quart jar, I'm coming up with numbers that work for a quart jar. You do need one piece of equipment you do need is a digital scale. If you were to go, because um, fermentation is a science, the bacteria that live in that jar whilst it's fermenting that transform that sweet cabbage into salty sauerkraut, tangy sauerkraut, they like a certain salt concentration. You give them the right amount of salt, then the beneficial bacteria multiply into the trillions and the pathogenic bacteria, they die off because they don't like that salty environment. So you need salt and you need to think of fermentation as a science. You can wing it. And when I first started, I did things by taste and just by sight, but I wasn't getting consistent batches. And then I realized much like a batch of chocolate chip cookies, you aren't just taking a chunk of butter and dumping in some sugar and flour and your vanilla and chips, you're measuring those ingredients out. And somebody has put that chocolate chip cookie recipe together based on science of how butter and salt and everything work together and sugars, how they work together when that item's baked in the oven. So it's the same thing with fermentation. So we start with that big bowl. We have our ingredients in there. We're adding sliced cabbage until we get to 800 grams. 800 grams, grams work much easier than ounces and pounds So switch that digital scale into grams. That 800 grams is what's gonna fit into a, a quart jar. It's not gonna look like it at all because in your big bowl, you have a big pile of sliced cabbage. You can go, there's no way that's gonna fit into a jar, but it does. So we have all that in the bowl and then we're gonna add a tablespoon of salt. Technically, scientifically, that's 2% salt. 2% of that 800 grams, we're taking a 2% salt concentration. So if you took 800 and you multiplied it by the 2%, by the 0 0.02, you end up with 16 grams. But that's like a tablespoon of salt. So we have 800 grams of ingredients and we have a tablespoon of salt. We sprinkle that salt over our sliced cabbage and we take our hand, or we don't need gloves, take our bare hands and we mix all that together to get that salt to go everywhere between all those different strands of cabbage. And you'll start to see that cabbage glisten, it looks sweaty. And what's happening is that salt is pull, pulling the water out of the cabbage cells. And then when we leave that bowl, just sit for a while, 20, 30, 40 minutes, you clean up your kitchen, you come back to this beautiful bowl where that cabbage has shrunk down because that water gets pulled out. And we go in there and we put our hand in there and we massage and squeeze it a little bit. Before we know it, it's shrunk down even further. We uh, tip the bowl to the side and there's this big puddle of brine in there. We need that brine. So instead of making a salad dressing for a coleslaw, we're creating this brine naturally. And we need that brine because the bacteria I keep talking about, they love what we call an anaerobic home without air. And so we're gonna take handfuls of that cabbage and we're gonna pack them into the jar and squish it down in the jar and it all fits into that quart jar. And as you do that, the brine rises above your packed sauerkraut. And that brine is what provides a home for those bacteria that has no air. They're stuck below that brine. So they're in that briny environment. They have just the amount of salt they like, not too much, not too little, and they go to work for you. They work furiously and multiply and multiply and they blow little bubbles to um, car they create carbon dioxide. And that moves the oxygen out of the jar to make it even more airtight so that only they survive and those pathogenic bacteria, maybe that cabbage had gotten sprayed with E. coli or you know, E. coli from the manure, that dies off. It can't survive in that environment. This is safer than eating that coleslaw because if there was E. coli on that cabbage, it's still there when you eat that coleslaw. 
and your body then takes care of it through the digestive system. Most likely you don't get sick. But in that jar of fermenting sauerkraut, that E. coli is killed off. It can't survive in that salty environment. It's a very, very safe food process. Nobody's ever gotten sick from fermented foods. It's uh, the nature of how it, the bacteria balance out. So you've got everything below the brine. You might put in a weight to make sure it stays below the brine. You might put a lid on your jar to make sure no additional molds or yeast get in. And you just leave that sit on your countertop. And it sits there for anywhere from a seven days to two or three weeks. And during that process, the colors fade. You keep seeing little bubbles come up to the surface. You know, the bacteria are working when you see that. Um, and eventually that tangy aroma is in the kitchen and you start to taste it and it has this beautiful tangy flavor of sauerkraut. So that's kind of the basic process. Did I completely kind of like confuse you? <laughs> And uh, you kind of so, and you kind of add things to it, you know, as well, like cabbage. I mean, like uh, uh, carrots or something like that. So, so that's kind of like the basics of, of it. You know, you can you add stuff to it? Yeah, you can add all sorts of things. So here's a picture of a passion pink sauerkraut, and that has in garlic and caraway seeds and shredded beets. Um, here's a picture of, let me find another one here. This one is times for leek sauerkraut. And that one has in leeks and carrots and garlic and thyme and sage and cabbage. So you can, uh, you know, this is a sauerkraut corn relish. And that one has in uh, corn and red pepper, jalapeno pepper, celery, onion, cilantro, mustard, and then of course your green cabbage. So yeah, there's all sorts of things you can do um, to your sauerkraut. This one is my husband's favorite. This is firecracker sauerkraut. And that Why do one- Why call me that? Because um, it's kind of a spicy sauerkraut. It has red onion in it, jalapeno peppers, oregano, cumin, red pepper flakes, and cabbage. Now I'm like having the fireworks in your mouth, huh? Well, it depends how, how many jalapenos you put in and whether you, you know, in the jalapeno, the heat is in the seeds in that memory brain, that in, inner, memory, inner membrane. And so if you scrape all that out, you'll get the flavor of the jalapeno, but not the heat. But he likes the heat, so I leave all that in. Oh, okay. So the heat is really in the seeds, but so, so if I scrape the seeds out, right, you, it, it, won't, it won't be as hot. No, and, and there's that little kind of pithy membrane, that white part, that's also mm. gonna hold the heat. So you just scrape that out and you've got the flavor of the pepper without the burning heat. Oh, so so it'll basically be like um, eating a bell pepper. Not quite, there's still a little heat, but I don't like heat and I don't mind eating the jalapeno in there as long as the seeds have been removed in the membrane. It's like a, a spiciness that you enjoy versus a spiciness where you're sweating and your forehead breaks out and little beads of sweat. Oh, gotcha. Uh, now, it also says that you are a fermentation expert. Just, um, yeah, 20 years of playing around with this and learning different things and working with um, making yogurts and milk, kefir and fermenting uh, cucumbers, et cetera. Just, I've, taught myself, so fermentation educator, and uh, just finding different ways to help people learn to uh, take vegetables and transform them into probiotic superhouses, you know, superfoods. Uh, for, for someone who is kind of ignorant, you know, like myself, uh, what is fermentation and how does it work? Okay, so fermentation, most of the fermentation that I work with is lactic, Lacto, working with the lactobacillus bacteria, lactic acid fermentation. And lactic acid is the, what is produced by the lactobacillus bacteria. So fermentation is a process where we take foods and put them with either culture, you know, with the bacteria and through the fermentation process, they're creating all sorts of vitamins and transforming that food into a nutritional superfood by the fermentation process. 
So those bacteria in there, they create lactic acid, they create acetic acid, they create, create a little bit of alcohol through that fermentation process. And like with yogurt, you're taking um, milk and you're, you're adding like yogurt from a previous batch. That's where your culture is. So your bacteria is in a previous batch of yogurt. You mix that into the warm milk and you let that culture over time. So the fermentation process is really just letting the bacteria do this wonderful transformation. It's done with all sorts of foods. And I'm mainly working with the vegetables and the lactobacillus bacteria to they eat the sugars and the starches in there. And so when you pack that, the, the sugars and the starches in the cabbage, that's what they're eating. And then they produce the lactic acid. The lactic acid is what acts as a preservative. It drops the pH. You'll start off when you, if you were to test the pH in the jar, it will be like seven or eight during the fermentation process. Fairly quickly within the first few days, they drop it down to below 4.5. And it's at that level that no pathogenic bacteria can survive. And that lactic acid that they produce is the preservative. And that lactic acid that they produce is the tangy taste we taste in the fermented food. They're digesting the food for us. So when we go to eat it, our digestive system doesn't work, have to work as hard because they've pre-digested the food. They've opened up the nutrition in the food. So there's more vitamin C and fermented cabbage than there is in raw cabbage because of the work of the bacteria. And we're just finding out every day new things that the bacteria do that our great ancestors had no idea about, but they just knew the foods were good for them. Um, so after so after you make this uh, uh, sauerkraut uh, that you just mentioned, uh, you eat it as is or? I, I like to keep things simple. Some people feel that you then have to come up with a recipe in which you use your sauerkraut. Sauerkraut on your own, is you think of it as a condiment. You add it to whatever meal you're eating. So if you put your dinner plate together, you pull out your jar of sauerkraut out of the refrigerator, dip your fork into the jar and put a couple forkfuls of whatever sauerkraut you have on your plate. Then as you're eating your meal, that's your digestive aid, especially with heavy, rich foods or uh, proteins, you know, meats and cream sauces and butters and fats, that sauerkraut will help you digest that and just make it much easier to, for your body to utilize and absorb the nutrients in that food. And so all you have to do, and so I hardly ever, ever, ever make any recipe or dish with my sauerkraut. If it's lunchtime, I've grated some carrots and maybe chopped up some leftover cold chicken and some cheese and nuts. And then I take a couple forkfuls of my sauerkraut and I mix them into the salad. I drizzle it with some oil and use a little bit of the brine from the sauerkraut, the liquid, as my vinegar. Put on a couple pinches of salt and that's my lunch. Dinner time, there's just a couple forkfuls of sauerkraut on the plate. And the fascinating thing about eating these uh, sauerkraut with your meal, it really makes the flavors pop. It's um, rich in umami, which is uh, the, our sixth taste out there, meaning uh, savory. And it just um, makes your whole meal taste so much better by having that little bit of tangy sour food on the side to open up the taste buds and make your foods just taste delicious by having that sauerkraut with your meal. So I can put that on a hot dog in there. So yeah. I can put that on a hot dog as well. Yes, any, any way you can think of. Anytime we have hamburgers, I always layer a fork full of sauerkraut on top of it. Because again, it just, the, there's a whole new flavor profile. On pizza, you'd be amazed how nice it tastes on a slice of pizza. If you eat eggs in the morning, it tastes great on eggs. If you make smoothies, you can put in a few forkfuls in the smoothie. Nobody will know it's there other than maybe a slight shift if they're good on tasting the flavor, but that's a way to kind of hide the sauerkraut with people who might not want to be eating it, but it can literally. Uh, I <laughs> yeah, because I know some people got uh, hypersensitive taste buds. Yeah. You know, they're, they're probably, they're probably tasting a mile, you know, a mile away. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But we need to um, educate our taste buds to enjoy these tangy flavors because those are the flavors that fermented foods are sour, they're tangy. Mm -hmm. And if you have young children or infants, it's a very good idea to get them used to these flavors early on. Those are flavors that their body needs and their body craves to maintain good gut health. And, you, and so how do you do that? So how do you train your, so how do you train your taste buds to do that? You start off very simple. You can just take the, put a little spoon down into the jar and just taste a little spoonful of the brine and just do that a few days in a row. And eventually your body starts going, I need this. My body, because you're, you're, the bacteria in your gut microbiome speak to you. They tell you what you want to eat. If your gut microbiome is out of balance, there's a lot of research out there that shows, say, if you're trying to lose weight, if you take care and rebalance your gut microbiome, your food cravings in because the bacteria are getting the right food they need and they ask you for the right food in essence. So the, the cleaner foods we eat, the more ancestral foods, real foods we eat, your body starts appreciating that. And I've known a lot of people who go through their jars of sauerkraut the first time that they introduce sauerkraut into their family rather quickly because their body's saying, I need this, I need this, and they're craving that taste almost. But you do want to be careful if you're dealing with gut issues or digestive issues that you start real slowly because there's trillions of bacteria more so than in a capsule of probiotics you buy at the store. There's trillions of bacteria in just a forkful or a sip of that brine. And when you end up eating too much sauerkraut or too many fermented foods all at once, that's more bacteria than your body can handle. And you could end up with some digestive upset because you've thrown way too many bacteria in there before your body knows what to do with them. So you want to technically go real slowly, but it's just introducing those flavors to people, you know, the sour yogurts, the sour, uh, you know, even kombucha is a little bit of acquired taste. They, you know, it's getting your taste buds used to those foods a little bit at a time. Yeah. I, I was going to ask what, uh, what advice will you give to someone who, you know, may have digestive issues? It, it's, you know, I, I can't give like medical advice, but um, digestive issues are saying that your gut microbiome is out of balance. And fermented foods help take care of your gut microbiome. There could be other issues to deal with, other things to take care of, but slowly introducing the... Uh, fermented foods into your diet is you're slowly introducing homemade probiotics that you would go to the store and buy in a jar um, as capsules. So if you're slowly introducing those, you know, I've heard from my readers, many, many people who have had digestive issues and have gone away by introducing sauerkraut into their diet. It's amazing how the human body can bring things back into balance if it's given the right foods to work with. Are you been something about being a fermentation uh, educator? Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, because I, I teach, I have courses online that I, I'm gradually putting together. So, um, and I have run local workshops. So I'm teaching people how to ferment their food so they can take care of their gut health and learn some new skills. So what, walk me through, uh, walk me through a particular, uh, walk me through to a particular course or a particular, uh, you know, class? What, what does it look like? Um, so my online classes are, I'm introducing people to what fermentation is. I'm teaching them the benefits of fermentation, kind of my own personal things that I love about fermentation, like connecting with farmers, learning new skills, those kind of off the wall ones. I'm talking about um, the bacteria and the home that the bacteria need and how we take care of the bacteria during the fermentation process. And then I put together, like for sauerkraut, I have what I call the surefire sauerkraut method. So it's seven steps people go through to be successful with a batch of sauerkraut and the kind of ratios you work with and the salt concentration. And so they go through a, a high level how to make sauerkraut, then we go through it step by step and then uh, go over all the different recipes and there's like a guide on how to, um, if you're not sure if the sauerkraut you made or the fermented food you made is safe to eat, there's different ways to look at it and evaluate it. 
Um, I teach people what to look for as their sauerkraut is fermenting. How do you know it's fermenting? What if there is mold growing on it or is that yeast growing on there? What to do? Do you need to toss it? Is it safe to eat? I talk about the safety of fermentation, how uh, that jar of sauerkraut is much safer to eat than to, technically than a green salad or a coleslaw because of the fermentation process. We talk about what happens during the fermentation process and how um, even if pesticides were sprayed on what you were fermenting, the bacteria can kill off the, or remove the pesticides. They've done studies where they look at the pesticide levels in the jar that you're getting ready to ferment and at the end number, numbers go way down or almost are non-existent. So we just learn about kind of how fascinating fermentation is, what a safe process it is, and then different ways to ferment different foods. So I'm uh, the sauerkraut course I have, and I have a, in a pickle course that talks about brine pickling, um, your cucumber pickles that we're all familiar with. So we can pickle with sauerkraut. The cabbage creates the brine in which it ferments. With brine pickling, we don't use vinegar. We use just salt and water. And that creates the environment in which the different vegetables ferment. Uh, can you do that with, you can only do that with cabbage. Can you do that with any other uh, uh, vegetable? You mean fermentation? Yes. Yeah, so you can make sauerkraut with your cabbage. And then we have, you know, if you go to the store and you see on the shelf, the asparagus pickles and the cucumber pickles and you know, whatever else is typically sold in a grocery store, you can ferment just about any fruit or vegetable you want. And there's different methods depending on how you, um, what vegetables you're working with. But typically um, cabbage is made into, you know, sauerkraut, but like your carrots, and you may flavor it with carrots and beets and things like that. But if you want a carrot stick to crunch on or a pickle to crunch on, then that is made through a process called uh, brine fermentation. And it, anything out there can be pickled or fermented. So is, is that like a growing trend, you know, now that that's what people are starting, you know, to do and, and you know, how long have this trend been occurring? Um, I'm going to say the trend has probably been going on about 25 years, bringing back this ancient preservation process that went on for centuries and got forgotten because people wanted to be just buy that can off the shelf and not have to spend the time making it themselves. But it's growing every year. The market, especially the market of um, providing finished products to the consumer in the grocery store, that is growing. Um, you look at just the kombucha market. I don't have numbers, but nobody knew what kombucha was 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when I made my first kombucha, you could not buy it in a grocery store. Well, now you can almost buy it at a fast food store, you know, or your grocery, your um, gas market, you know, that's everywhere. And so that's um, just a great way for people to get introduced to fermented foods and get their first taste. And maybe they start with kombucha and then all of a sudden they wanna learn other fermented foods, but it is a, the industry where they're, um, developing the products to sell to the consumer is growing gangbusters. Um, 2007 is when they did the first, uh, I might be off on the date, but about that time when they did the gut, 2010 maybe, the gut microbiome study where they looked at all the bacteria in our gut and mapped it all out. That was kind of the real um, beginning of the scientific basis behind the fermentation and how valuable the fermented foods are for us. And so, it's just growing year after year after year. Um, when I first launched my website in 2014, there was not a lot of competition out there. There weren't, if you were to search for how to ferment asparagus, how to ferment carrots, how to ferment whatever, there was just a handful of websites out there. Nowadays, you ferment those things and everybody's got a recipe for those. So it's becoming more and more popular. More and more people are wanting to learn how to uh, you know, take care of their health through the foods that they ferment. So uh, are this is like any mainstream coverage. You yeah, know, you'll see. Um, New York Times just did an article yesterday or sometime this week on the benefit of fermented foods uh, for health. And so it, you're seeing it in on NPR. You're seeing it on all the major news stations out there. Um, 
there is a lot of coverage on it because of that gut microbiome study and everything that we're learning, how important it is to take care of our gut health, that that's where health resides. Um, Hippocrates said that, that you know, health begins in the gut. And so today we're able to prove that by doing all this research. Um, 80 to 95% of your serotonin is produced in the gut. And so if you're looking at depression or not feeling happy-go-lucky and something's out of balance, the first place to look is your gut and looking at your gut health. Um, so they're finding so much stuff begins in the gut. So what we can do to take care of our gut health um, is a great place to start. Yeah, but, there, but there's also, uh, you know, when I turn on the TV, is some pharmaceutical company you know, say, hey, take this pill, you know, for, for you know, for gut, gut health. Right. You well, you have to look where the profits are and who's buying the ads and who's selling the ads and, you know, what, where one's getting their information from, you know, it's, it's all the pharmaceutical companies running what we're seeing out there. And so we have to really do our homework and connect with people who are looking at, um, taking care of your health through the foods we eat versus popping some pill. So, um, so I, I think really in the last, what, uh, 20, 30 years, we, you know, we see a lot of things pop up to where, you know, it's all about convenience. Yes. Uh, also, including the foods, you know, that we buy in a grocery store. Right. Every single day, it, you know, it's about you know, convenience, but when we actually, you know, eat foods that are grown in the earth, I could imagine that people have been taking their time and their hard work, you know, blood, sweat, and tears to produce, you know, that food. Right. You know, obviously, you know, obviously, you know, in your opinion, which one is better? The, uh, which one being more beneficial. Right, but which one, but what are you asking me, the, the farmers growing the food or the? Or, or cause you know, a lot of the, cause you know, I think they even starting to, you know, uh, you know, social engineering some of the, the, the vegetables. No, you, you no, know, please. We, <laughs> yeah. I, I hope, I hope that's, you know, that's not the, you know, the case because you know, and I don't know how true this is that, you know, that a lot of the foods that we eat is not as healthy as we think it is. Right, because our soils aren't as healthy as they used to be, et cetera. I guess when I'm looking at diet and looking at guidance um, and, you know, I'll get into the convenience, I'm always going back, what did our great ancestors eat? And it's really just taking our vegetables and the fruits and vegetables and our meats and our dairy and making our own foods with those. And um, to me, if it's in a package, somebody's making a profit with it. If it's gonna sit in a package for any length of time, they've gotta be putting some chemicals in there to make it, to preserve it, to have it sit on that shelf. Rather um, than doing it the natural way. The, right. Uh, the back, yeah, the bacteria Again, naturally. Was, what's that? Again, it's about convenience. Right, but actually these fermented foods can be very convenient. I can take 15, 20 minutes to put together a batch of sauerkraut. And then for the next two or three weeks, all I do is open that jar and I have that snack food. I can in 10 minutes throw together a jar of fermented carrot sticks. And if I'm looking for a little snack in the afternoon, it doesn't take long to open up that jar and pull out a few carrots out of that jar. Yeah, I was going to ask, well, you know, how long does it, the fermentation process take? The fermentation process, depending on what you're making, can take anywhere from, say, seven to 10 days, two to three weeks for most fruits and vegetables. You know, the, the typical vegetable lactobacillus, you know, lacto-fermentation process. Um, and then those foods can last up to a year, most of them. Because technically, you think about it, we were preserving this food to get us through the winter because we did not have refrigerators and we didn't ha did not have a way to can these foods. So we kept them in a cool place and we ate those foods over the winter season when there was no foods at the grocery store and right. nothing growing in our garden. 
And then come the next season, we had kind of finished up that stockpile of convenient foods we had. And then the new ones were harvested and we then would preserve those in some way. Before it so gets like, to Yeah, when I'm making dinner, I have, I, I make a fermented garlic paste. I puree, we grow our own garlic. And then we ferment a lot of it into a garlic paste, which is putting garlic cloves in your food processor with salt till it's into a nice paste. And then that is um, fermented. And so I go to saute greens. I don't have to chop up garlic. It already was done in one big batch in the food processor. And I scoop up a, a couple scoops of the garlic paste and I immediately season my uh, um, spinach. You have to think ahead and plan ahead. And it's a choice on, do we wanna lead this convenient life where I can just pick up food on the way home from work? Or do I want to spend a little bit extra time to make these nourishing foods that keep me healthy, keep me out of the doctor's office, keep my health bills down and take care of my own health. So I feel vibrant and energetic. And uh, when I can make my own foods and feel empowered by that and work with my community, and you know, I don't grow a lot in our garden. I like to support our local farmers, but when I can have that connection, that's where my convenience is. You know, it's uh, how do we want to spend our time? scrolling on Facebook or spending 20 minutes to put together a batch of sauerkraut that my whole family can eat for a few weeks and be nourished by that. Now, the stuff that you're talking about, you know, what doctor in the world will, will tell you that? <laughs> they don't. I'm, I'm, not. Just being, uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just being real. I mean, right. but you, you have know, when you go to the doctor, you're paying all this money you know, and they tell you to, uh, you know, take a pill, you know, right, take, a pill for, take a pill for everything. <laughs> Our medical system is not health care. It's disease care. And those doctors are trained to come up with a diagnosis. They get the code that they can bill to the insurance company. So they're either going to give you a pill or they're going to operate on you. And that's all. That's what you're going to get when you go into to see a doctor. You're paying so, all of this money instead of, for example, you know, what you've been, you know, talking about. Uh, and I hear a lot of time that, you know, growing food, you know, from the earth, you know, is, is, is healthy. Yeah. It's healthy, uh, especially if you got that rich, you know, soil. Yeah, exactly. You know? And you need to learn to grow that rich soil. What, what is that? How do we get more nutrients into our soil so we get more nutrients into our, the foods that are harvested? And being out in that garden, if you walk in it barefoot and put your bare hands into the, uh, the earth, you're interacting with the, with the microbiome, with the bacteria in that earth, and that's good for you too. So it's, there's so many situations when we go back to the basic that are you know, beneficial for us and will keep us out of the uh, doctor's office. And you know that they do not want us to stay out of the doctor's office. No, they don't. That's, that's what their bread and water come in. That's why you I have mean, to find, yeah, you have to find like-minded people and find communities, mm -hmm. people that think like you so you don't feel like you're an outsider and that you're all alone. There's many people who are in the same frame of mind and who want to connect with people who don't think it's crazy to go spend an afternoon making a few batches of fermented foods and talking with your friends as you do it together as a you know fun project right so so i think that that's you know some things that you know we can actually bring to the community like um you know that's one of the uh, an organization i'm a part of you know we're talking about you know health and wellness you know, uh -huh. and I think that's something that, you know, that we need to, you know, educate people. I don't, I'm, I'm clueless. Uh, so I, I'm clueless when, you know, when it comes to that. So I need to be educated too. But it's starting with something simple. It's like, we can't solve the big problem. What is the one little change we can make? Well, maybe I have learned how to ferment sauerkraut, or maybe I've learned how to grow beans, or maybe I know how to you know, harvest, you know, chick, uh, raise chickens for eggs. And you take that one little skill and you invite some friends over and say, hey, I learned to make sauerkraut, come sample it and let's all make a batch together. And that ripple effect, it's amazing how it spreads out into the community because people 
try these foods, they like them, they realize how simple it is. And just that one little simple change of teaching one friend how to uh, preserve their foods the way our great ancestors did can be, uh, you know, you can impact a lot of people that way. Okay, we're getting ready to wrap up here, but real quick, what are some of the content on your website? Um, it goes over, you know, how to ferment different foods, how to ferment sauerkraut, how to ferment fruits and vegetables. There's a lot of tips on there on um, fermentation, different like weights you can use in your jar, what equipment you need, um, a little bit on gut health and how it impacts uh, how fermented foods are connected to that. Um, my book is on there. It's a uh, I self-published it, so it's an Amazon book that's printed through Amazon, or it's available as a, a PDF uh, download on my website, and then I have courses on there on fermentation. And uh, what is the uh, website address? So makesauerkraut.com, so M-A-K-E-S-A-U-E-R-K-R-A-U-T.com. And if someone wanted more information about you or your content, how are they able to reach you? Um, they're on the website. There's a contact page. I'm on the social um, Instagram and Pinterest and Facebook. You can contact me through there. There's an about page on there. And uh, you know, I, I do actually read all my emails and respond to them. So a lot of ways they can reach me. And, wow. and on the website, the little download that's in the bottom bar and on the homepage is uh, seven fermentation mistakes you think you might be making and how to avoid them. Even if you haven't started fermenting, it's a nice little download to have because it introduces you in kind of the backdoor way into the basic things that you need to know about fermentation. Fantastic. Uh, I'm, I'm just learning. I'm just learning new stuff. Every time I have these podcasts, I'm just I'm yes. learning new stuff. And, and that, you know, that's what it's all about. I mean, you you hear about the traditional, you know, stuff that everybody is talking about, but it's it's good to have people, you know, on here that has something unique to offer. And this is definitely because uh, I, I, you know, never even heard of this in my neck of the woods. And whereabouts do you live? Oh, I'm, I'm in Alabama, the deep south. Okay. Yeah, and Alabama is probably a little bit more of a challenge for fermentation because it's a warmer climate. And so there's a shorter window probably where you can ferment ideally. And uh, who knows what kind of cabbage you have, but it can be done. I have people from Alabama, I'm sure, who have been fermenting. It'll but, probably uh, be like when November or December would probably be. Yeah, your ideal time. But people do ferment other times of the year and put it in an ice chest with some frozen water to keep things a little cooler. So, uh, but yes, it can um, be done. For someone who's living in the deep south where, you know, it's, you know, it's kind of warm and sometimes we do have those short winters. Right. So what would be the best time to do it? Well, your, your winter months are ideal it's because it's cooler then. And that's when, you know, I don't know when cabbage is grown in the south and when it's harvested, but that would be typically when that cabbage would be harvested is when you want to be slicing it into a nice thin strands to make into sauerkraut. That, that's probably something, you know, I can look at. You yeah. Know, as well. well, Holly, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time out to uh, be a part of this podcast. Yeah, I, I, certainly, I certainly learned some new stuff and I'm quite sure that I view any listening audience will as well. And, um, and we have your contact information. Excellent. On, you know, on here. So hopefully that uh, uh, someone will, you know, catch on to this and, and all the information that's on your website is absolutely free. Right. Yes. Yeah. The, the, the courses and the books you pay for, but there's, you could easily learn how to make wonderful sauerkraut and have a handful of recipes to choose from without, uh, you know, pulling out your wallet at all. The, okay. So let's sit there one more time. The content on the website is free, but the courses and the books you got to pay for. Yes. <laughs> okay. Just, just want to make, just want to make that announcement mm -hmm. one more time. So that's going to wrap it up here. Thank you so much. 
Yeah, thank you. And I expect an email from you sometimes saying you made your first batch of sauerkraut or you're in the middle of it and this is what's happening and please help me. <laughs> uh, believe me, if, if, if you know I get stuck or have some questions, I'm definitely going to be emailing you. That's yeah, for sure. that'd be exciting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so we're going to end it right here. Uh, Holly Howe, our guest, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, for being you. a part of this podcast, the Author Showcase, where we showcase authors. Um, and you don't have to be uh, a book author to be on here. Uh, we have some people that are bloggers. You know, they have a blog. Or you do like, you know, video blogs. You know, we're opening it up to that. And if you are a publisher and you have like an independent publishing company, you're welcome to come on here as well. So it's not just, uh, you know, book authors. I, I know in the past we, you know, just have book authors, you know, to come on. But uh, we know recently we had a lot of people that prefer to do blogging. And I visit some of these blogs, and a lot of these blogs have some really great content. So why not have them on this podcast, you know, as well? So we're open up to bloggers and video bloggers and, and publishers, maybe someone uh, that's out there that said, you know, hey, uh, you know, I got this idea for a book, you know, help me out. So, and, you know, pretty soon we'll have publishers, you know, on book publishers on here as well. So again, thank you so much for being part. Uh, we got a great weekend uh, of podcasting to do. We got some great guests, some interesting topics. Uh, this weekend, so make sure you tune in. Uh, tomorrow, we have uh, another book author that's coming on here, so tune in at 7 p.m. Central. No, I'm sorry. That's 7 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Central. And until then, y'all take care. Enjoy the rest of your Friday.